in the beginning that the war had very little effect on the average American. After uh, war years and people were, were debating the right or wrongness of Vietnam, then it started having an effect. But during the 60s, there was not much effect unless your son was there. If your son was there or your daughter was a nurse or whatever, then you worried about uh, the war. But the average person got up, fought traffic, went to work, uh, got his paycheck, bought his six-pack, and, you know, had his weekend and watched football. And if, and if Vietnam came on, he flipped the channel. Back then, we didn't have um, little flippers for your, your channels, but uh, they changed the channel. Vietnam was boring. America was so confused. I mean, for the first time, you had fathers and sons fighting over what is patriotism. You had brothers and sisters fighting what is patriotism for the first time since the Civil War. And it was confusing. Families were broken up, emotionally, physically broken up over the Vietnam War. Did you know these people personally? Did you see it? Did you feel it? Oh, I, I know them. I know my friends. You know, remember, you know, when you sit for years in classrooms and you're in a, in a parochial type community where you stay relatively close, you're there because it's either your township, if it's a public school, or if it's a Catholic school, you're there because it's your parish. You go through school all these years together, and then you grow up. Some go off to war, and some stay home. When you meet again, that meeting where you, you met originally in the hallways of the different schools when you were a little boy and little girl, when you were protecting your head from the atomic bomb, when you meet that same little boy or little girl, you had an affinity, you had a love and a respect for, and all of a sudden there's a distance because you served in Vietnam. And that hurt. It hurt a whole lot. And even those that, that were against the war, somehow they confused the war and the warrior, and they became somewhat against the warrior. And that's my resentment to them. And it's strong, and I'll, I'll take them on. I'll take them on strongly on it, too. It, it was wrong, and, and they hurt us, and there were a lot of Vietnam veterans hurt because nobody but nobody thought about the, the returning veterans. It was war, peace, and unfortunately, we were instruments, gears, in the machinery of war, and we were expendable. And to this day, I mean, during the 60s when it was vogue to take a black to lunch, during the 60s when the women's movement was just starting, during the 60s when the Hispanics and brown power were starting, during all the movements, our movement, who wanted to take a Vietnam veteran to lunch? If you have a real expensive piece of equipment, maybe you'll hire a black, maybe you'll hire a Hispanic, maybe you'll hire a woman, maybe you'll hire an Eskimo, but you're not about to give that expensive piece of equipment to a Vietnam veteran that the media is portrayed as psychotic, neurotic, explosive, temperamental, so what happened, that's why the Vietnam veterans started dissing themselves. That where they used to hug Miss Molly, uh, little Molly in the hallways of school, they put that distance in there, that wedge in there. Their only peace, their only solace was in themselves. Their only peace, their only solace. The substance abuse that the Vietnam veterans experienced was acute back here in America, not in the war zone. They may have been introduced to different substances overseas, but the abuse of it was back here because they could escape, they could hide. Their, their rates of alcoholism, their rates of marital breakup, all those things are much more dramatic than any other segment of society. The rates of unemployment even to this day. And we would debate. I mean, I had a friend of my wife's who was strongly into the anti-war movement. And she was always welcome at my house and still is to this day. And she was, you know, she had her point of view. I respected her. I respected every protester that stood out there on the street and said, we want this to happen. I respected Cassius Clay who became Muhammad Ali because he did it within the system. The guys who went to Canada, I don't respect them at all because they didn't help the system. They didn't change the system. They didn't point out to the gutless, spineless politicians, you shouldn't go with the flow. Something's wrong here. Let's fix it. So the people, those protesters, I had a lot of respect for them because they were pointing out. They were saying either fish or cut bait. They were saying the same thing I was saying in a different way. 
They wanted the same end result as a soldier. Soldier wanted peace. They wanted peace. We both wanted peace. I saw them drawing out the war, but I respected what they were doing. To this day, you know, I'll sit down and, and chat in a room, and people know where I stand, and I know where they stand. I have to respect them for standing up for their cause, and that's what America's all about. And that's what they taught us in the 60s and the 50s, and those folks from the 40s planted it in our head that we can. If it's on our mind, if it's in our hearts, it's in our soul, we can talk about it. We don't have to always agree. And that's one great thing that came out of the 60s generation, is that we can agree to disagree. And that's a wonderful thing. I think before that, everyone tried. And that's why the politicians who were in power were all trying to agree. They couldn't make a decision. I think the protesters and those that were serving in uniform would all be proud, not as though they would like them, but be proud of a politician who wouldn't make a stand on an issue. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. One day they're bombing, next day they're not bombing, one day they're doing this. You know, come on. You're either going to do it or not do it. You know, it's, it's like being almost pregnant. You can't be almost pregnant. Something, you know, when something happens, it happens. And in war, war was happening. So I respected those guys in the sense that they were doing what they believed in. The folks who ran away to Canada didn't do anything for America, the United States of America. They didn't do anything for the brothers or the sisters. They didn't highlight an issue. And as far as I'm concerned, they're gutless and didn't do anything for me or my brothers or sisters. The splitting, splitting of a generation, children you grew up with, your friends that you made your first Holy Communion with, that um, you did little things with in life, that you, you, know, you made your bar mitzvah with, whatever it was, all of a sudden there's a change. And that change is something that you, you couldn't put your finger on it. It, it was painful. You would like everything to be the way they were in the early 60s and late 50s. You would like every woman to be there at home and, and every man to have a job. But things were changing. And we didn't know how to identify those changes. It was probably the most painful thing was a separation of generations. But what happened was the anti-everything group, and I have to tell you they're anti-everything as far as I'm concerned, they were also anti-Vietnam veterans. And by being anti-Vietnam veterans, that really, really hurt us. Um, because that, that really split up the gal you made your first communion with or the guy you made your bar mitzvah with. That was the cutting point when they turned on us. And that group, the people that were speaking for peace, never picked up a banner and said, you know, we want to help you guys get a job. We want to march to Washington for a job for you guys. Maybe you did something that we didn't like, but it wasn't your fault. You were in your, your teens, you graduated from high school, you didn't really know the depth of it. And I, I just feel that that was a separation in society. Now, can I talk and chat with those people? Yes. Can I play intellectual and mental gymnastics with those people? Yes. Um, no one wants peace more so than someone who's seen war, and I can explain that to them as best I see fit. But if you're going to engage in a war, I'll tell you how to do it and how to finish it real quick. And um, I don't ever, ever see another protracted war that America's going to get into. And I think the peace people made their point and made it very clear. And as a result, there's a lot of uh, understanding about the national uh, politics of the world today and about each other. In terms of overall learning process, Unfortunately, many, many people say they love the 60s, but the 60s were just full of, of negative explosions. There's not a whole lot of good to talk about. A city. Oh, I love the 60s. Well, what was so wonderful about the 60s? The 60s, we had some of the most prominent, wonderful people in the world killed. We had Vietnam. What was so wonderful? You got to smoke grass? What was so wonderful about the 60s? There was a lot of pain. So. The good that came out of it is that we got out of the 60s, we're still a nation. I mean, uh, there's an awful, awful lot of, of hurt, an awful lot of people that um, look back at the 60s and they think it, it's romantic. You have to remember, during those ty types of strain, there's a lot of romanticism uh, because you're doing something unique and different. 
However, I don't know that's good. I really don't know that's good.